you guys welcome back to the let's go win podcast where we're here to help you be happy healthy wealthy and get better every single day i have a guest that's going to come on and we are talking about something that everyone goes through at some point whether it's good or bad we are going to be talking about searching for jobs job seeking really that career management and she is an expert she can absolutely guide us in this discussion because I think when you say job search, everybody immediately rolls their eyes and they're not excited about it, but it doesn't have to be that way. Deborah Boggs is an award-winning entrepreneur, international speaker, and guest for top-rated podcasts as an expert in executive career growth, C-level job search strategy, and board candidate best practices. She was recently honored by Forbes as a next 1,000 entrepreneur and is currently a member of the Forbes Business Council and Chief. Additionally, she is a founding member of the Career Industry Authority and holds a master's degree in management. Deborah, what's happened? Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited about it. Oh, I'm excited to have you on. I mean, I guess to say job search, maybe that's too generic because you do focus on executive job search and that is your expertise. But I want to start with something. 70% or 71%, according to Gallup, of people walking down the hallway are currently not satisfied. How are we screwing this whole thing up? Because I know companies are looking for great people. Great people are looking for good companies. But somehow this whole thing, 7 out of 10 people are not happy. What the heck is going on here? It's so interesting. Uh, you know, I'm so glad you asked because when I talk to candidates – you know, even at the highest levels where you would think, you know, they've got really great compensation, they're able to pick the company they work for, things like that. The things that we're not thinking about is that, not to sound cliche, but during the pandemic, it really was that our priorities changed. And, and I saw that in every conversation I had with a candidate when, you know, one of the first things I say to candidates when we're thinking about their job searches, what does that ideal next job look like for you? And a lot of times they'll say things like, I want the right culture. I want the right environment. I want to find a company that does meaningful work. I want to find, even if it's not nonprofit, it's, it's doing something that I believe in. And, and on the other side, I think companies are, are slow to catch up with what, what, the workforce is demanding right now out of work, right? It's not just a paycheck. It's not just security. It's really more about those other areas of our lives. And a lot of companies, especially bigger companies, you know, slower to change, things like that, different industries are not able to keep up with where that flood of, of, um, of uh, you know, wh where everyone's wanting to go right now. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go down the culture path because it's, when I talk to companies, I can say, to a hundred companies and 99 of them will get this wrong every time. Hey, what's your culture? And one executive will say one thing, another say another, and then another will say another. And by the way, I was guilty of this myself. I, I was one of those guys in the room that created the culture, but did such a poor job of giving that cascading communication, making it simple enough for everybody to really understand. So it is interesting where, if you don't truly define that culture, how, how do people know what, what they're stepping into? Okay, great. Uh, it's a good salary and I like the work I'm going to be doing, but how am I supposed to show up? How, how am I supposed to behave? What are the responsibilities that I truly have? Somehow that gets lost in the job description uh, yeah. you know, conversation. So how can we improve on this? And again, we'll get more into the job search itself, but I'm just curious if you were talking to these companies, how could you help them say, man, let's get clear on what your culture really is? Mm -hmm. You know, this is a great question because I think, um, you know, it, I think starting with listening to your current employees of what's going on, what are the challenges? What are you hearing? Because I think there's, you know, especially in a larger organization, I think there's a big difference between what senior leadership expects culture to be and then how that filters down to everybody else right and what the culture actually is day to day and not every rank and file employee is going to tell an executive what they suck at and so i think um you know it's around you know even bringing outside parties in to say let's do let's do a culture check let's find out what's going on let's take you know let's get some some actual surveys from our team and find out what they're experiencing because i think sometimes in the mid level managers and and just the processes and the ways um you know that that we think culture is one way but but the processes may be stopping um that from actually happening and you get into all the all office politics and all of these things 
may change the actual experience for the worker um, in ways that they don't see unless they actively look for it. I want to switch gears to really the job search because there's a topic on here that says keeping up morale during a long or difficult job search. And literally, if I say, all right, job search, as I mentioned in the beginning, you get that roll of the eyes like, oh, my gosh. Instead of looking at, as you and I were talking off air, I look at it as a recruiting process. You're going, it's exciting. This is new. This is fresh. This is, ex you have like this whole future ahead of you. But so many often, opportunities. Yeah. But often people look at it like, oh, what a drag. I have to go look for a job. Well, if you go in with that, it's probably going to go pretty poorly. It would be my guess. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because um, so so our firm works with uh, vice president to board level leaders, right? So we work with typically the most senior leaders in a team. And so when I say that, a lot of times if people are faced with a layoff or they know they're going to lose their job or they know the company is going to go through a merger and they're, you know, and they're going to be redundant, all of those things. Um, if they come to me right after that happened, I will typically say, if they've, you know, everyone's got a different situation, but if they've got the luxury of time to wait, I will, I will typically say, take some time to digest it, to digest this, to come to terms with the loss of your job search. Because if you go in with this negative mindset, it's going to permeate every single um, aspect of your search. And it's really going to take longer rather than just dealing with the feelings and the grief and the things, and then moving forward from there. This is really interesting because it is a true grieving process. When you leave, let's say uh, anything you've committed, uh, I don't know, six months, a year, 10 years, 20 years, like you're talking substantial relationships, time, energy, because we go to work and at least 33% of our life is spent at a career. So yeah. this is not a like casual loss. This is a big deal. And I, I, I want you to really drive that point home because I don't think people realize, man, you truly are going through a grieving process. That's okay. Deal with yeah. the fact that maybe you're hurt, even if it was the right time, even if you made the choice to move right. forward, you are losing something that was an integral part of you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting we're having this conversation today because I had an article come out in Forbes yesterday about the unique challenges that executives face during a layoff. And that's not to say that it's not incredibly hard for everyone at every level, but sometimes executives have a different level because, um, because you know, you do have maybe 20 years wrapped up in a job or you, you know, so much of our identities are wrapped up in our job, especially as you get into higher titles and things like that. You've been climbing the ladder and now it's it, it's a loss. It's a grieving process. It takes longer for some people than others. I think even if, like you said, even if you do make the choice, you still have to come to terms with that, what that means for you. You have uncertainty in the future, certainly the um, significant uh, uh, financial aspect, especially because there's less jobs at that rate, right? And, you know, you've reached a compensation level where there's less opportunities there. And so there's so much emotion wrapped up in that, that it really is helpful to stop, take a breath, and and heal a little bit before you leap in because if you leap into the job search then it's desperate and it's needy and it's you know maybe you're you're still bitter about how you were let go and that's coming through in interviews and and you may take the first thing that comes along and and I tell you know my executive candidates when they ask how long a job search takes well it it can depend could you have a job tomorrow probably is it the right job with the right company at the right compensation probably not that's the part that takes the time Let's break this down because I'm a big list guy. I'm like, look, man, let's put the line down the middle. On one side, we have the pros. On the other side, we have the cons. And I think what you're saying is, look, we're looking for compensation, but we're also looking for something that lifestyle. We are looking for culture. And the truth is, when you look at it, I think compensation ranks actually number five is my understanding. I'm curious to hear what, what yours is of when you're really looking for the right fit, the right, again, 30 some odd percent of our life is going to be spent at this. It's not just about the money because trust me, I've been in a place where I'm making significant, like seven figures and miserable. I don't want anybody to feel that way. So what would you tell people? Like, what is, what should we really be looking at? Whether it's an executive job search or just, you know, a normal job search, because I think the feelings are similar. And as you said, this is our livelihood. Let's make sure that right. we really find a place that we're going to take care of our family, but we're also going to be happy. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where getting really clear on the focus of a job search, regardless of your level or you know what you're looking for, is really helpful. And so that's the number two thing I typically tell people. They call me and say, I've just lost my job or I'm starting a job search. And and, and, you know, we'll say, okay, do you need to take time first before we start any of this? And then the next thing is, okay, let's get really clear about your goals. Let's get hyper-focused on what you want because that will make the rest of the job search easier. And it goes beyond just the function, right? You want to be head of sales or you want to, you know, be a, an account manager or whatever that is, but it's what industry, what type of company do you thrive best in? I, I've only known one candidate in my entire career who uh, said they prefer um, startups and enterprise level companies the same, right? And they do their best work in both. Most people have a preference between the size of company, the maturity of the company, things like that. Um, so think about all of those things. And, and certainly salary is one of those. What is your, you know, what is your um, threshold for what you need? Um, you know, what kind of management do you work best under? What kind of, you know, do you need remote work? If you're going to be in office, what does that commute look like? Is that stealing two hours from your day? And how are you going to feel about that? So thinking about the ideal opportunity first will help drive a, a more targeted job search that will result in the right opportunity at the end. I'm curious how you found your career, because now we're talking about everybody else finding theirs. You do something that's pretty cool where you're literally... I think of it like you're placing people in their dreams. They are placing their faith in you to connect the two. This is not a simple like transaction. This is a big relationship that that they're putting a lot of faith and trust. How did you find your way into doing what you do today? I think my path is similar to a lot of people that struggle with, you know, I was nearly 30 before I found. I'm an entrepreneur because uh, this is the longest I've ever uh, stayed in a job. I get bored easily. So I think re, you know, iterating on my company keeps me focused. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right. It's really interesting. The, the clients that we typically work with, the people that come to me and my firm usually are, um, have really built their careers through their network, through getting promoted, through, you know, getting recruited into opportunities. And they've built their careers over 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And then they find themselves having to take themselves to market in a formal job search for the first time since college. And they have no idea what that looks like. Not only the times have changed, but the but the level is different. And so they go, you know, I see a lot of executives, um, I mean, all the time will send me a resume that is literally the format they used when they got out of business school or when they got out of college that every career services department from Harvard to community colleges recommends. It's the exact same thing. Um, and they've just been adding jobs to it, right? And and so they'll send me this and they'll say, well, I'm you know, starting a search. And, and so their, their documentation isn't presenting them as a leader. Um, they don't really know how to go about that search process. So they go to what they know, which is checking on, you know, looking for jobs online, applying to things that, you know, are available. And, and that's just a recipe for rejection over and over and over again, because the resume is not positioning them as the leader they are today for the, um, for the roles they're looking for and qualified to do today. And the, and, and executive jobs are not typically found online. And so they may be perfectly suited for all of these roles they're applying for, but for a ton of reasons that I won't get into because we only have so much time, you know, they're not going to get a call back for that job that has nothing to do with them, but they're getting rejection after rejection. And then they start to feel like, oh, you know, no one's going to want me. I'm going to die broken alone. I, you know, I can't get a job. And it's really about the process and the strategy and the way they're taking themselves to market and not their qualifications. So the resume obviously you're trying to represent here's who i am these are the right. skills i have it's kind of like the first interview but it's on a piece of paper that's a right. challenge and that's where i think your guys skill set what your company does is a right. remarkable because look i i same thing you put down your accolades and where you that doesn't tell you shit about who the person is it just okay. says here's what i've done sort of for the last some odd years so it is a real skill set that you guys clearly bring to the table. Thank you. I, I think if I'm an executive right now, you almost have to have a service so that, or I'm curious this with AI, is it helping or is it hurting when it comes to like creating these resumes or CVs or whatever they you, you use now to, to go out there? Right. You know, I think it's such a great question because, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation in the career industry um, around AI and how that's affecting not only our businesses, but our clients and our and, and the job seekers. Right. And I think that AI is really helpful in, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, so so we use AI with our clients, but not necessarily in the way to write a resume. Right. It's really more around how to get deeper in the content, because um, at the executive level, you need, you know, the the. Think, okay, so think about this, and I'm kind of going in circles here, but I want to illustrate it to make it make sense for everybody. At the executive level, your years of um, of uh, experience and the titles you've held and the companies you've worked for are table stakes. That's what you need to even just get in the door, right? What's going to set you apart is your leadership style, your accomplishments over the years, what you, you know, what you did to move the needle for the companies, things like that, right? And so it's not necessarily just a list of the things that you manage because everyone's going to have that same list. And that's not going to set you apart at the compensation with the companies that you want to work for and all of those things. What you want to think about is what you did in those years, how to how to communicate your value, your unique value, right? And so the way I, AI can be helpful, to give you an example, I was talking to a corporate compliance leader. Um, he works for a Fortune 500. He leads corporate compliance, um, started as a, as a corporate lawyer and kind of worked his way up through his career, had never needed a resume before. And corporate compliance can be really dry, right? You can't give a lot of detail. But at the same time, if you just talk about what a corporate compliance leader manages, then the resume is going to be the same as everybody else because they all manage the same thing. So what we did is, um, you know, I pulled together a few questions for because I wanted him to think deeper about the metrics we could include when it's not a sales job, right? How do you how do you show your value when you don't have sales and marketing or you don't run a P and L or things like this? And so I I pulled together a few areas where we could really dig into some stories for him and um and some accomplishments. But I also used AI and said, what are metrics to pull on a resume for a compliance executive? 
And it came up with all of these options, right? And so I pulled a few that made sense for him and I sent them and said, let's go deeper in these areas. Um, and then we were able to talk through the options and, and really dig out meaningful content. And so don't think about AI as writing the resume for you because it's not going to be deep enough, but it can help you deepen the content if you use it correctly. Yeah, it does. Uh, it, it's trying to write your own stuff. It Unless you have a really healthy self-esteem or you are somewhat of an egomaniac, it's hard to be like, hey, let me tell you why I'm so freaking amazing at what I do. I think that's where, you know, people like yourself and your team, that's where they bring that out and they ask the proper questions. Um, I want to go into, I mentioned earlier, career management. And yeah. I'm curious because often you hear the two words used simultaneously, job, career. I think there's a distinct difference between the two. If you're going in with a job, I'm literally thinking, all right, this is a temporary thing. I'm not going to make a career out of it. So when I say career management, what does that mean? And why is that so important that we kind of, I don't know, maybe build that this is what my career versus this is just a job? Because am I right. fair in saying that they're different? Because to me, I don't ever want to hire somebody for a job unless it's literally I'm outsourcing or I'm doing something temporarily. A career is like we're in a relationship together. We are dating during the interview and we're getting married. That's kind of the thought process I have. Absolutely. You know, you're absolutely right. The career management and the reason, um, so so my company, DNS Executive Career Management, we, we intentionally chose career management because it's about taking a proactive approach to the future of your career. It's not just walking through the doors that open or taking the opportunities that are there because they're available. It's around how are you thinking about the future of your career? How are you maximizing your experiences, your compensation, your opportunities, your network, all of those things for the future and not just helping you get that next job, right? It's around how are you taking a proactive approach to the direction of your career in a way that um, goes a lot deeper than just like a one-time job search. Are you guys uh, kind of the matchmaker? And my question would be, do you have both the executives that are seeking and you have the employers that are seeking? And really you're going, all right, I got a roster of executives over here and I have a roster of you know companies over here and we're just really trying to make the right fit. Is that a big part of what you all do? So it's not, and I'm glad you asked, and I can explain why and what we do and what we can help with, but the pieces that we don't do. So we work with executives on an individual basis and sometimes corporate outplacement if they, you know, if they're going through an out, you know, if they're going through a layoff, but it's around helping an individual prepare for and navigate their search. But we purposefully don't do the recruitment and the placement because we want to be the objective third party that just cares about where a candidate lands and doesn't make money on both sides. I don't want a stake in the game on where a candidate lands because I feel like, you know, everybody else has, a, you know, an emotional stake, right? It may be their, you know, their spouse or their partner. It may be, you know, their family. It may be, you know, um, uh, you know, the recruiter they're working with. All of these things, everyone has these opinions. And we would rather just be the partner for the client who's looking for the right thing, right? And so, um, so anyway, we intentionally just work with. So we typically will do, you know, getting clear on a direction, resume, LinkedIn profile, job search strategy, compensation, negotiation, um, consulting, things like that. But the piece that we also do offer though, is, is recruitment um, networking, right? So we can, we do have access to a targeted list of recruiters and we can help um, build a, you know, build a network of recruiters for a candidate. We talk about how to work with headhunters, how to work with placement firms, things like that, but we don't physically do the placements. Got it. No, I'm glad I asked too, because again, I've, I'm lumping this because it's been so long since I've had it's to do common. this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we also talked about landing on being a board member. Now I have a neighbor that he is, I think he's a member of like six boards. Nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not sure what his skill set is that makes him different than others that aren't on a board. I got to tell you, man, I'm like, I want to be on a board. That sounds really fun. It's like, you're, you're giving some advice and you're guiding, but you're not in the day to day. It looks like a really cool position from the outside looking in, but I couldn't tell you what he has versus 
anyone else. And that's not a slight towards him. He's a great dude, right. but I don't know what are the skills that people that are looking for board members, what are they really looking for? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's such a great question because the skills that are required of a senior executive in a career role are going to be different than they are for a board director, right? And so we work with a lot of candidates that are maybe either preparing for retirement but want to stay busy or they, you know, are hoping to start, you know, in that career management space, space thinking about off-ramping in the next five to 10 years and want to start a couple of board roles to help, you know, pad their income as they start thinking about that. So there's a lot of different reasons people may want to pursue boards, but I always say, you know, the search for a board is going to be very similar to a job search at the executive level. You still are going to need a board level resume, a board bio. They're uh, two different things. Um, you're going to have to have, you know, a, a well-created LinkedIn profile. So th the start of the process is all going to be very similar. Um, you're still going to have to get really focused on the types of companies that you would be best equipped to serve. Um, that way we can get focused on that, right? And then after that, it's around the board specific skills. And so the skills are going to be more at the advisory level and not at the at the tactical execution, right? So it's going to be around, um, you know, some, uh, it's a little bit different for every industry, but thinking about, you know, this is where executive leadership is going to be table stakes. And then it's what else do you bring? Do you have global experience? Do you have, you know, have you helped guide a company through an M&A? Um, have you done any transformations, you know, with large organizations? Do you have large P&L experience? Um, you know, do, do you have a specific function? So one that's really important right now for boards is cybersecurity, um, legal expertise. There's a lot more opportunity for uh, for general counsels to, to join boards uh, recently. There's, you know, because some, some board members will come to me and say they're a DEI expert or, or they're a CHRO or chief human resource officer. And I say, you know, that's great. And, and that's definitely a board skill, but you need to have that and something that drives the business because um, just, um, unfortunately, just HR or just DEI is not enough to help move the needle and you need to maybe expand on your skills in some other areas. So there's a lot of different skills that are, um, that are you know, attractive for boards, but thinking about not getting into the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, responsibilities of a job and more about where are you a where are you uniquely equipped to guide a C-level team in strategy and direction of the company and not necessarily in physically building a team and doing a thing? So I'm without saying his name, he clearly has a bunch of skills because I'm telling you, he's like six boards and the guy's he's early fifties. And I look wow. at it. I'm just remarkable because that it just looks like a fun gig. Honestly, it's like, Hey, I go to a meeting right. once a quarter or so. And, advise on a weekly phone call as I'm chilling in the Bahamas. It's like, yeah, it's not a bad gig. Well, um, it's interesting you say that because it's once you get that first board role, I always tell people the first one is the hardest. And after that, once you've been on a board, people, it's like it's like the the entry for you, right? And then everyone thinks, oh, well, you're perfectly suited to be on a board. So we have a partnership, um, uh, you know, a relationship with the New York Stock Exchange for their board, um, board readiness program. And and the reason I bring this up is, you know, someone had called me the other day to get board level resume and bio together, and they'd come from this organization. And and um, and she came to me, and she already sits on a public board. She has sat on other public boards before this, and we, you know, we talked about her, her, you know, what she would need. And I said, honestly, you just need to pick up the phone and call your network. You do not need me. You're beyond needing me because you're you're already so board ready, and you've sat on public company boards that that you know your resume doesn't matter anymore. It's now who you know and how you're how you're um, activating your network. Which is a, a huge point, I think, in both these, exec the board search and job seeking. So you guys prepare these guys and you're ready to go. But honestly, their cell phone is probably the gateway to the majority of what they're right. looking for. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. And, you know, some people will call me and say, I have a great network, um, but I don't want to leverage my network yet until I'm clear about my ask. And so sometimes they'll say, you know, I, you know, um, I, you know, I know everyone in the industry, but I don't know what I want yet. And I want to get really clear on that before I start talking to people. So that's where we can be helpful, but you're absolutely right. You know, in that executive search, your network is going to be what drives, um, you know, most of the value for you. And that's where you need to focus. 
So my son just signed at Marquette. I had told you that off air. And the reason I bring this up is I'm looking for any excuse to be in Milwaukee for the next four to five years. But to your point, I reached out to all my Wisconsin contacts and people that have known me for, gosh, almost 40 years. Can't believe I'm 45, man. How's that possible? I've known these people forever, but you know, they asked the same question. They said, tell me exactly what you do. I assume they know, right? Like, you know me, therefore the truth is we actually don't know a lot of what our good friends and family members do professionally. And so to your point, I had to get extremely clear to say, all right, I work with companies from 1 million to 50 million in sales and leadership. And it started to narrow it down for, I'm thinking of one person in particular, but until I did that, she was like, well, I, I don't know. I guess I can send you some contacts, but I don't know exactly what you do. So right. that clarity piece is so important. You know, you're so right because people want to help. Um, and, and I always tell people, you know, don't send a blanket message to your, you know, to your whole group and say, I'm looking for a new opportunity. That doesn't say anything and people want to help, but you have to make it really easy for them. And so instead sending a message and saying, Hey, you know, haven't talked to you in a while. I want to let you know, I'm open for X and such types of roles and X and such types of industries. Here's my resume in case it's helpful to share with your network, you know, making it really easy for them because otherwise people aren't, especially if they don't know you are not going to comb through your resume to decide what box you fit in. You need to tell them. This would be maybe the biggest, I'm going to push as hard as I can right now, because if you're looking, if you're an executive, you're searching for a board seat, or you're looking for a, another career, another job placement, seek Deborah's company out. I promise you this part where you try to do this on your own, I meditate, I write things down. I can't bring it out the way someone like Deborah can. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I want to give you open forum, Deborah. Anything I didn't know enough to ask you, and you're like, man, we got to hit on this before we start to wrap this up. Anything that you want to just open forum, free form, go for it. Oh man, we could talk all day. Um, I am such a resume and and job search nerd, but one thing I do kind of get on a soapbox about when we're thinking about executive careers that we didn't really touch on. You know, when we think about LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is as important as your resume, especially at the executive level, even at the board level. And so I think a lot of people who've built their careers through, you know, their, especially internal network. I had someone from a fortune 10 call me the other day. Um, she's C level at fortune 10, but she said she spent her whole career in the, the same company. And so she has a very deep network inside that company, but not outside. Mm. Um, and the reason I bring this up is if you haven't been focused on LinkedIn, you need to become focused on LinkedIn. And I don't mean, con you know, creating content and, and putting posts out there. Sometimes that can be really stressful for people. But I mean, LinkedIn is going to be your only opportunity to make a strong first impression. So you need to have it have um, the content that you need, but also the executive presence visually that you need. And so that's going to be a featured section and a background image and a very strong headshot. And so at the executive level, I don't want you cropping a photo out from a party um, or, or, you know, uh, taking one that's maybe, you know, 15 years old that you had really great hair that day or something, but we need to think about that, that headshot on LinkedIn is going to be exactly like you would walk into an interview because that's what people are seeing. And that's the first impression they're getting. And I think sometimes that's an afterthought for a lot of people. And at the executive level, it's really crucially important. So uh, if I could put on a banner, you know, um, spend some money and some time doing a headshot with intention for LinkedIn as a part of your search strategy. Yeah, and it is interesting how much a part of our world social media has become, but yet how Facebook is different than Instagram is different than LinkedIn is different than YouTube. And I definitely have fallen to that where I'm like, ah, it's, it's me, man, just put it out. And clearly there's a vast difference between Facebook and LinkedIn. I think it's really important. And I'm glad you brought that up because – Again, I I don't know that I've done a great job with LinkedIn because I'm just kind of, hey, man, people know who I am. Well, maybe they don't. Deborah, you're awesome. I I think a lot of people that are considering uh, maybe looking for another deal or should be looking at their career management. Like I said, you, you guys are awesome. Where's the best place for my audience to find you if they really wanted to dig into, hey, maybe I want a board seat. Maybe I want to 
do an executive search, even if I'm not looking for that job today, but I'm starting right. to prep. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the, for the kind words about our work. We, we certainly enjoy it. And and so people can find me, you know, um, easiest place is LinkedIn. I put a ton of content out for executive job seekers, board search, um, you know, news about the job market, things like that. Um, so find me on LinkedIn. It's uh, Debra Boggs, D-E-B-R-A-B-O-G-G-S, or my company website. You can learn more about me and my team and the services that we offer at dscareermanagement.com. Awesome. Well, guys, what you don't know is the first time we went to do this, huge storm came through, knocked out power. Then the second time I screwed up and had to reschedule. Deborah, your patience is a virtue. Your knowledge is incredible. And, and thank you, because this is really not something we talk about often, but I think it's so important and for people to know that there's amazing resources like you and your team. So thank you for coming. The opportunity. This was really excellent conversation. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Guys, go check Deborah out. Go to LinkedIn. I'm going to go. I don't think we've connected yet. I'm going to be doing it right after this. Connect with her on LinkedIn. Go follow her stuff. I'm telling you, it's it's really interesting because I've talked to her off air several times because of my screw ups. And I've learned a ton. Even if I'm not looking for a career search, I can advise others. on. Here's a great resource. So please go check it out. Until next time, remember your mindset matters. I appreciate all of you guys so much. We'll talk soon.